Let's pray. Father, we come now to this time where we're going to open your scripture and see what you would say to us. And I'm thinking, Lord, of the portion of text that we're going to read. I'm thinking about the importance of it for us, the importance of it in the life of Christ, the great tragedy of it. Father, would you use it to speak to our hearts, to help us find comfort in you, and to submit control of our lives to you. Be with us, Lord, in your name. Amen. Guys, if you want to open to Matthew 26, that's where we're going to be. Chris didn't say it when talking about uh, the need for volunteers for the children's ministry, but we were sort of joking before the service. Um, you, everybody in our church has one of two options. One, you can either serve in the children's ministry. That's your first option. Everybody has that option. You can do that. Or you can invite someone to church and hope that they serve in the children's ministry. <laughs> but you cannot do neither. We need volunteers for children's ministry. You have one of two options. You must take one of those two options. There is not a third option for a church like ours. So uh, I say that um, to guilt you. And let's, let's read the gospel. Um, so uh, we, every week leading up to Easter, we have been looking at a different scene in the life of Jesus, the, the last week of his life as he walks toward the cross. And we've been looking at it through a very particular lens, and that's to discover who are the people that Jesus loves. Like, who are the people that are immediately around him? And what themes can we pull out of that? And what can we see about the type of people they are? Because I think that the closer Jesus gets towards the cross, the more acute it becomes like the, peop, the, the, the more acutely he is aware of the type of people who, is, who are around him. The more acutely he is aware of the type of people that he is ultimately going to die for. That he is walking toward the cross. He knows the tragedy coming. He knows the torture that's coming. And with every passing moment, he sees the people around him. And he might start thinking, seriously? People like this? These type of people? And yet these are the people who Jesus Love. So we want to get to know what those people were like and think about those types of people. And so we've been in Matthew 26 going through this, looking at these various scenes as we come closer to the cross of Christ. We're going to start in verse 47. Actually, we're going to go back one. This won't be on the screen, but I'm just going to read you verse 45 and 46, and then we'll pick up in 47. This is the end of what we read last week. Jesus came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. While he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend. And that word translated friend is not beloved friend. It's not close friend. It's associate. It's somebody who you, who's, who's near you. Do what you came to do. Then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, have you come out? As against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me day after day, I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. The story of Judas's betrayal is so familiar that to be associated with the name. Judas has become synonymous with being a traitor. 
There are few people in history, there's only a few characters in history who you may not want to be compared to. Judas is one of them, maybe Brutus, maybe Benedict Arnold, people that if someone says you are like them, it is not a good thing. But Judas stands at the top of the heap because we know that the central tragedy of this story that we just read of this section of scripture is that Judas betrays his friend Jesus with a kiss of all things. But there's so much more that's going on. Jesus wakes up his disciples and tells them that there's no more time for rest. The moment of his betrayal had come. A great crowd has now come into the garden. By some estimates, the crowd of people could have been up to 200 people. There, some of them are armed with swords, others with clubs. The group of people that sent them was the Sanhedrin, or the chief priests and the elders of the people. They uh, were the judicial and religious body in the city of Jerusalem. And their job was to essentially keep the peace. That they stood between the politicians and the people, and they made sure that the people didn't riot, that there wasn't rebellion. They were there to kind of quell the people, and as a result, they were richly rewarded. They were given power, they were given wealth, and so they wanted to maintain all of that. And furthermore, as a quasi-religious political group, they were given protection by the Roman government of up to a couple hundred armed Roman soldiers. And so some commentators see this when they say that some of them had swords and some of them had clubs as a reference to the fact that the Sanhedrin may have sent the whole Roman guard to go get Jesus. Certainly some of them were from that guard. Others just were maybe private hires by the Sanhedrin, private protection who had clubs. Of course, leading the pack is Judas. Matthew tells us that the famous kiss of Judas, that he, that he prearranged this with the guards, the one I kiss will be the man that you are to arrest. And so he does. The guards seize Jesus and take him into forced custody. When the disciples see it, one of them in particular decides that he's going to do something about it. No one is going to take Jesus without him having a say. We learn later on, unsurprisingly, that this disciple is Peter. It's notable that the only gospel writer to tell us that it's Peter is John. And John wrote his account of Jesus' life long after Peter was dead. I think the other gospel writers probably wanted to spare poor Peter some additional embarrassment since the next story is how Peter just outright denies Christ. But this one here, Peter pulls out his sword in this supreme act of bravery, probably swings it downward at the head of the temple servant, a guy named Malchus, almost certainly trying to hit him on the top of the head and kill him or seriously wound him, but here's the problem, he misses. They grab Jesus. Peter's like, I got you, Jay! Yeah! And clink, and everyone just stands there like, what just happened? There's no record that they attacked or that a fight broke out. They all just sort of stood there like, what was that about? Jesus is like, Peter, man, you gotta chill. He heals the man's ear. Malchus is like, for real? For real, Peter? Then Jesus looks at the crowd and he asks him, do you really think this whole thing was necessary? Like, you guys could have taken me any day, at any time, I would have come with you, but this is the way that the plan was supposed to go down. And with that, all the disciples, including Peter, flee the scene. I mentioned last week that the way I study and the way I studied Matthew 26 was looking for these themes that would emerge between or within the characters that were presented to us in these scenes. Many of them are familiar, and uh, some of the themes would emerge quickly. And, uh, but I wanted to get a picture of the type of people that were around Jesus. And the more I studied this passage in particular, the more the theme emerged. Jesus loves people who need control. Jesus loves people who need control. What I mean is that the people in this passage act like most of us. To desire control is, to desire, is, is at its core to desire to exert our own will over our circumstances to achieve a desired result. To, to desire control is to want to exert our own will over our circumstances to achieve a desired result. 
Now, typically, if we think about a controlling person, and don't sit here and think about somebody else, think about yourself. When we think of a controlling person, we think of it in a derogatory way, because usually the person we are thinking of doesn't just exert their will over their own circumstances, but wants to exert their will over other people's circumstances. They want other people to do what they want. When we think of controlling people, we think about people that aren't just concerned with their own business, they're concerned with everyone else's. They want you to behave the way that they think you should behave. They don't just want control over their behaviors and circumstances, they want control over yours. They want to tell you what you should think. And that's certainly a controlling person. But that's just the extreme. Most people aren't like that, but it doesn't mean we aren't controlling. Our control may not spill around to the people around us, but it's true that for every single one of us in here, we desire to exert our own will over our circumstances in order to achieve a desired result. That's what we want, and we will do it at all lengths. And so we are all controlling people, and everyone in this passage is like that to varying degrees. You have the guards sent by the Sanhedrin and the Sanhedrin themselves. You have Judas, and you have Peter all of them acting out of a spirit of trying to control the circumstances to exert their will over the circumstances to achieve a desired result. I think there's three reasons that, th- three things that motivate us to try to get control. And the first one is impatience. I'm going to start with Peter because his is the least egregious and probably the most universal in terms of how we try to take control in our own lives. We try to do it because we are impatient. We don't like waiting. We don't like to see how situations will unfold. If you read the stories of Jesus and the narratives of his life that you find in the gospel, one of the things that stands out about Peter is that he has this streak in him where he's extremely impetuous. If you don't know what impetuous means, impetuous means to move quickly without thought or care. That this is what Peter does over and over. There's probably a lot of reasons that he has some control issues. One of them is Peter is probably one of the older disciples. Maybe Peter is one of the leaders of the pack. He's clearly motivated. He probably had some natural charisma. But he's impetuous. A person who's impetuous leaps before looking. They make decisions quickly without thinking through the implications. On the Myers-Briggs personality chart, the Apostle Peter is an ENFP. If you know your Myers-Briggs, You, and you are an ENFP, you are like Peter. You are an outspoken motivator who says whatever comes to your mind. You are probably a charismatic leader who people are attracted to, but you probably also spend far, far too much time worrying about what other people think of you. That's an ENFP. The impetuous person is Michael Scott from The Office, who has already driven his car 10 feet into the lake before realizing what he has done. The person who starts a sentence hoping they will figure out what they want to say along the way. Peter is the first one to jump into the midst of the crowd after Pentecost and boldly preach the gospel. But Peter is also the one who was rebuked by Paul because he was so worried what the religious leaders would think when they showed up and saw him eating with the Gentiles and the people who were unclean. So Peter, the impetuous person, is the one who would declare to Jesus, I would rather die before I ever leave your side, and then just to prove it, when he's confronted with a mob of a couple hundred armed men, Peter, the brave, decides he will take them on himself and a single sword. And fails miserably. And Jesus is forced to clean up another of Peter's glorious mistakes. Peter wants to control the situation. He wants Jesus to think well of him. Maybe in his angst, he wants the situation to go his way, to achieve the desired result that he's been thinking of, to get Jesus free, and he would be the hero. The thing is that most of us, if we were honest, would admit that one of the reasons we become controlling with our own lives, one of the reasons we don't submit to control to God is because we lack the patience to see what God is doing. You don't have to be an ENFP or a naturally impetuous person. You might not do it often, but you probably sometimes make decisions or choices that turn out to be the wrong ones because you make them too quickly. Generally speaking, I am not a person that leaps before I look, but there are certain situations in my life where I have made terrible choices, either because I was sick of thinking about it or because I didn't care. 
I was talking to someone recently. They said that uh, the areas that most people do this are with cars and real estate. Making choices that you don't really think through the implications. This is why we end up in a housing crisis. Because everybody, everybody thinks, of course I can afford that house. Until you can't afford it. But you picture yourself in it. You think, but my life would be so much better if I was in that house. So you go look at the car on the, on the car lot and you drive it around and you think, you know, if I had this car, I'm pretty sure I would be a better person. And then you, get, you make the first payment and you realize, I can't do this. We make these choices where we jump into them. It's often our lack of patience, our impetuousness that leads us to want to control our own lives. Jesus tells Peter, put the sword away. If you're going to live by the sword, you will die by the sword. If we could take that statement metaphorically, Jesus certainly means it literally, but we could take it metaphorically. And we could say, if that's how you want to control things in your life, If you want to control things with impatience, if you want to control things with impetuousness, then that is the very thing that is going to control you. A second motivator is fear. This is the motivation of the chief priests and the religious leaders. That's the reason that they wanted to capture Jesus to begin with. They were afraid that they would lose their position of power if they didn't take this man off the streets who was extremely popular with the people. The religious leaders, the Sanhedrin, they said, if this guy is allowed to instigate a rebellion, we're going to lose our position of influence, we're going to lose our wealth, and maybe we will be the ones who end up in prison. And then, when they sent the the crowd, the mob, to go get Jesus, they do it at night, after the Passover dinner. When everyone is sleeping or resting or in their homes, why do they arrest Jesus in the dark of the night? Because not only are they afraid of the people who are in power over them, they are afraid of the people. Because Jesus is popular, and they know if we arrest this guy when people are around, and this is what Jesus is getting at. He goes, why didn't you arrest me in the temple? They know why. Because if we arrested you when people were listening to you, there would be a riot. And we don't want that. So we're going to take you in the middle of the night and we're going to see next week that they're going to try him in the middle of the night and rush him through a sham trial in the middle of the night so that by the morning when the people awoke, Jesus was already condemned. Because they were afraid. What they needed was a person who could tell them where Jesus was and when he would be alone. They needed a time and place where no one would see them. They needed a time and place when they knew that the majority of the population would be occupied. Jesus or Judas was the willing accomplice. The perfect spot was the garden, the night of the Passover, the perfect time. But Jesus knows the real motivation. You're here because you're scared. Have you come at me like a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I sat in the temple teaching, but you didn't seize me? See, fear is an incredible motivator. How many times in our life do we attempt to take control of situations because we're afraid? Now you go, it's not shaking in your boots afraid, but you're afraid of what the potential outcome could be if you don't make this choice right now. How many times do people, you know, sometimes people will purchase a home or pay more than they intended to because they're afraid if I don't get this one, there's no more. I won't get the next one. People, I've spoken to people who've taken jobs because a job promotion came up and they didn't, they were kind of thinking through the implications, but they thought to themselves, if I don't take this job, then I will never have a job. Or other people who never want to leave the position they're in because they're so afraid. If I leave this and go pursue something else, I'll never find a job then. And so we're motivated to make choices and decisions by fear to control our lives because we're afraid of what the outcome would be if we didn't make the choice or the decision ourselves and right now. But then there's a third motivator. Selfishness and pride. I mentioned a couple of weeks ago the possibility that Judas' motivation for selling out Jesus, Judas and Jesus, and when you have a son, Judah, This makes it extremely complex to say these words over and over. Even when I was writing, I kept writing Judah. And by the end of this, Judah will have betrayed Jesus. Um, Judah's motivation for selling out Jesus was to force his hand and bring about rebellion against Rome. That's one possibility. It's possible, but very unlikely, that Judas thought that maybe Jesus really was who he said he was. Like maybe Jesus really was the Messiah, and so he wanted to force his hand. 
well, if you get arrested, if he's in, in captivity, then G Jesus, if he really is the son of God, is going to have to work his magic and go and take over Rome once and for all. But that's unlikely. Judas may have been sick and tired of the whole thing. He wanted to get out before the whole deal went south. Maybe he had some friends in high places, and they were like, listen, w whether you help us or not doesn't really matter. Like, Jesus, this thing's going down. Jesus is going to get arrested, and you guys are going to be scattered. And Judas says, okay, i got to pad my pockets on the way out. Maybe that's his motivation, but probably, more than likely, is that Judas saw Jesus as a means to an end. Je Jesus probably wasn't the Messiah, the way that he had been saying, but he was powerful, and he had a lot of influence amongst the people. So Judas didn't necessarily want Jesus to be condemned. He didn't want Jesus to be crucified, but he figured that would never happen anyway. He thought, well, once Jesus was captured, they're just going to put him in prison, but it's going to make the people so angry that the people will rise up in rebellion, that the people will come up and Jesus will eventually be released. And at that time, I can bury the hatchet with Jesus. He'll get it. He'll know why I did what I did, why I used him, because I had to use him to get the desired result. The very thing that the Sanhedrin wanted to avoid, Judas wanted to instigate. Rebellion amongst the people. Judas was willing to turn Jesus over because he knew that Jesus' arrest was a small price to pay if it meant that the people would finally be motivated and mobilized to fight back against the Roman oppressors. In any case, he takes control, and he does what controlling people do. They exert their will over their circumstances in order to achieve a desired result. And in this case, it only benefited him, and it goes terribly wrong. We may not know why Judas did what he did. We know it was selfish. We know that it required him to turn a blind eye to all that God had done. We know it almost certainly meant that he didn't know that Jesus was the Son of God unless something else happened that we are unaware of. We know that it meant he would betray a friend. We know he was trying to take control of his future, but whatever he wanted to accomplish goes horribly wrong. His blind pursuit of control puts him in league with the worst type of people. He thinks that they will serve his purposes. What he fails to consider is that maybe he is serving theirs. And soon Judas realizes that in his plan to just simply get G Jesus arrested, Jesus is in fact condemned. And Judas, in great remorse, tries to return the money, realizing that he has sentenced his friend to death. That it would not result in what he wanted, but it would result in something else entirely. And in the great remorse, Judas goes and he kills himself. If we were honest, the reason that most of us feel the need to control our circumstances, and even sometimes the circumstances of others, is because the result that we desire is only going to benefit ourselves. It's selfishness and pride. The irony of the narrative, and the one that's clearly not lost on Matthew, is that the only one in the situation who has the power to control his circumstances and the right to do it is Jesus, and he's the only one who chooses not to. That instead of being impatient, Jesus is deliberate. The reason that I read those two verses leading up to this text in verse 45 is that Jesus says in verse 45, and then later again he says it, he says that this is the hour. He refers to this being the hour. He doesn't mean that it's like 8.30. He means, no, this is the hour that God has appointed for this to happen. That the way that we are proceeding now is we are proceeding into the hour when I will be betrayed. And then the hour when the crowd will come. That he's deliberate. He understands and knows God's timing. And he's willing to submit to that timing. And so he's willing to, be, to follow through on these actions. That he can trust that when it is time, God will make the path straight. If we apply it to our lives, what would we do differently? If you really trusted, and I mean really trusted, that God had a plan for your life and that his timing was perfect and that when it was, when it was God's time, he would make your path straight. What decisions would you hold off on? What type of things would you allow to be content in? Because I am sure that I've made decisions quickly and without proper, proper thought because I was not willing to wait for God's timing. And I'm equally as sure that as I look back over the course of my life, I can see the traces of God's hand in that certain events transpired precisely when they needed to in my life. In a certain way, 
Trusting God's timing is the prerequisite for you to have contentment. It's the prerequisite to be okay with where you are. Because the reason that many of us are dissatisfied with our life right now, what's happening, our circumstances, is because we want something else to happen and we don't trust that God has appointed the hour. Secondly, Jesus is not afraid. He is bold. He's not motivated by fear. When the betrayer comes in the crowd with swords and clubs, he knows exactly what's going down. He shows the same confidence and boldness he has had at any other time. He doesn't back down. Why doesn't he back down? Because he's fully aware that what is transpiring is according to God's plan. It's within God's control. That's the irony of this text. Everybody thinks they are in control, but when Jesus looks at Peter or he looks at the crowd, he doesn't see their authority, he sees God's. So he says to Peter, hey, you know, he's like, don't stop. Peter pulls out a sword, slices Malchus's ear off, and he's like, hey, you don't, you just put that away. But then he's like, but this had to happen because of the scriptures. He goes like, you didn't intend to follow God's will with that, but actually this was according to God's will. And then the crowds come and he says to him, why do you guys think you had to come at me with swords and clubs? He says, but you had to, according to the scriptures. Like, this had to happen so that the scripture would be fulfilled in verse 56. Jesus knows God's word. He knows what God has said. He knows the promises and commands and directions of God, and he knows that they're eternal. And so even when he's facing this immense tragedy, he's bold, knowing that ultimately it's God who's in control. There's a comfort in knowing that ultimately we can submit ourselves to the control of God. If we see God as just some other being, Somebody holy who has little impact or doesn't concern with us personally, we're not going to do that. But what Jesus enables us to see is not that God is some distant cosmic figure, but actually that he's our father and we can trust him. And then lastly, Jesus is not selfish, he's selfless. He's the only one who could have changed his circumstances and had the right to do it. He looks at the crowd and he says, seriously, you guys with this? Seriously, you're coming at me like, Peter, you're using a sword to defend me. You guys are coming at me with swords and clubs. Like, don't you think that I could call down more than 12 legions of angels who would come defend me? And he means two things by that. A Roman legion was somewhere between 3,500 and 6,000 soldiers. So he's talking about somewhere in the 50 to 80,000 range. The point is it's a much larger crowd than you've brought here tonight. He says, you, you 200, like you, that's, not, that's not even intimidating enough if you really want to take me by force. But he's saying two things. Number one, I have the power to call down an army to wipe you guys out if I want to. And number two, the way that he asked the question somewhat rhetorically, he says, do you not think? The rhetorical question is intended to point out to you, yes, I could have the control, and yes, I could do that, and yes, it would happen. Not only do I have the power, I have the right, because I am the Son of God. And if I right now chose to defy my Father's will, I could do that. Make no mistake that if Jesus does not have the power to take another direction, then his submission means nothing. Jesus has the power and the right to take another path, to do something different than what he ultimately does, but he chooses in willing submission to give himself to his Father's control, to give himself to his Father's plan. Jesus' obedience to the Father's will is meaningless unless, in reality, he has another option. But he gives it up, allows the Father to have control. Because he had another way if he wanted to take it. And so where everyone else fails, Jesus succeeds. You see, that's kind of the scenario that's presented to us by this text. It, the, the question isn't really who's in charge. The question isn't really whose plan is ultimately going to play out. The, the question isn't, is God in control even when people are misbehaving? It doesn't mean that our choices don't have consequences? They do. We have the option to disobey. We have the option to go our own way, the same way that Jesus did. But the question when we consider that God's plan still carries forth, even when we are being disobedient, is what are we going to do about it? Will we willingly surrender to God's control over our lives? Will we willingly decide that God's plan for our life is better than the plan that we have brought forth? Will we willingly surrender to it? 
Or will we attempt to continue to control our own lives, circumstances around us, to achieve the ends that we desire? See, in the end, that's the choice we face, to either willingly surrender to God or continue to follow our own path. It's the choice we face when we see Jesus in the garden. It's the choice we face when we see Jesus on the cross. It's the choice we face when we see Jesus at the resurrection. Do we do things the way we want or the way that God calls us to do them? Jesus' life is a demonstration of what submission looks like. But his death and resurrection are the thing that empower us to actually submit control. They're the thing that empower us to say, I can now follow the will of God for my life. That the de- his death and resurrection move this from being just a good idea into a reality for our lives. That the message of the good news is that the Holy Spirit takes the obedience of Christ and applies it to you. So that our heart begins to change and we actually begin to desire God's path for our life instead of our own. That rather than seeing our lives primarily as something intended to serve our own self-interests, we begin to see our life as a means through which we can bring fame and glory to God. That's the message of the gospel. Our lives become vessels through which we can love our neighbors around us because of what Christ has done. In short, we give up control. Jesus loves people who want to control everything because there aren't any other type of people. So Jesus does what we could never do, surrenders control to God so that we could be set free from the bondage of our own self-interest. And the more we give up control of our lives to God, the more we'll know that we have been set free. That's the gospel. Let's pray. Father, We thank you for the opportunity to look at this today, Lord. To consider what it means for us. Lord, I don't know whose shoes we would put ourselves in. Peter's, Judas's, the crowd. We can't put ourselves in your shoes. But Lord, by the power of your cross and by the power of the Holy Spirit, you enable us respond to God's plan the way that you do, with willing submission.